Hi guys, it's Josh. As you may know, my team and I, we specialize in reviewing laptops. We test hundreds each year. Finding the right one, it is super hard. There are many different options. There are a lot of different specs with really confusing names. It's just a very stressful experience. And walking into a store and speaking to a sales rep, it is rarely the right move. Most of the time that I'm there and I overhear them giving advice, it's just outdated and sometimes even wrong. Just think about it. If you know a lot about computers, you probably aren't working on a sales floor. So today, I'm gonna to walk you through everything that you need to know to pick the right laptop. And today's video, it is brought to you by our website, bestlaptop.deals, where we show you all the laptops that we recommend for various types of users. Now, the first thing that you need to decide on is what you're going to use the laptop for. You see, there are six main types of laptop users. The simplest are people who just want a laptop for basic homeschool or office use. Say you're just browsing the web, working on documents, or taking some Zoom calls. Or you're a student and you're studying a discipline that just doesn't need a powerful computer. Law, med, business, they're all great examples of this. You guys, you just want a high quality, reliable laptop with decent battery life, preferably one that doesn't break the bank. The next type of laptops for people who just need performance but don't really care about anything that requires graphics like gaming. If you're a software developer, audio engineer, trader, you guys, you want a laptop with a powerful CPU and a good amount of memory. That's because you use specialist applications and those applications are just more demanding. And you tend to have more of them open at the same time. Also, to effectively use specialist applications like software development IDEs, you'll want a large high quality screen. That's because those applications have a lot of capabilities and you want to be able to easily find them without squinting. Next up are laptops for gamers. For you, the GPU, also known as the graphics processing unit, is the most important factor. A GPU is much better than a CPU at rendering 3D images, and that's what most games are. A more powerful GPU means that games look better and you get more frames, making gameplay smoother. Just because the GPU is the most important factor though, it doesn't mean the CPU doesn't matter. You'll still need one fast enough to keep up with your GPU. Now, a very similar use case to gaming is 3D rendering. The reason I'm separating out this category is because of Apple's MacBooks. Most modern games, they do not run on Mac OS. You need a Windows laptop. But rendering applications for design and art, they run very well on MacBooks. So if you're just doing 3D work and not gaming, a MacBook Pro is a very viable choice. Next up are laptops for video and photo editors. When you export a video, it's called rendering. But this is a different kind of rendering to 3D rendering that I already talked about. You see, videos and photos are 2D. Each of the images are stored as bitmaps that are compressed to take up less storage. To render a video or edit a photo, you need to decompress each image, do whatever changes you're going to do to it, then compress it back again so the file isn't ridiculously large. These operations are mostly performed via media engines, not GPU cores. But the more powerful the GPU, the more of these media engines you get. This means more powerful GPUs are faster for this task. In addition to this, video and photo editors will want a high quality screen with a wide color gamut. That's so that the images just look accurate. And just like all other professionals, you'll want a decent amount of memory and a screen that allows you to see a lot of information. Next are data scientists and AI developers, a rapidly expanding field. Just like gaming or 3D rendering, data science applications use a laptop's GPU, not really its CPU. What separates these tasks from gaming though is that AI models are extremely memory dependent. This is specifically the memory available to a GPU. Do not confuse this with system memory that is used by the CPU. Other than this, data scientists, just like any professionals, they run professional software. So you want a decent amount of memory and a great screen. Finally, if you cross use cases, you're doing multiple things on your laptop, you want to ensure it meets the minimum requirements of each of the cases you're going to do on it. All right, now that you know what kind of laptop you need, it's time to pick the components. Let's start with a CPU. There are four manufacturers, Intel, AMD, Apple, and Qualcomm. Intel and AMD, they use the traditional x86 architecture used by Windows computers. These processors support the widest variety of applications. The negatives of Intel and AMD is that you either get great battery life 
or you get great performance, but not both. This trade-off is because their processors just aren't that power efficient. Also, if you want a powerful processor from Intel or AMD, there are additional trade-offs. Higher performing processors require a lot more power. That power generates more heat, which needs to be dissipated. That means you'll want a larger laptop with a more robust cooling solution. Generally speaking, the more performance you get from an Intel or AMD laptop, the heavier it is, the less battery life you get, and you may have to deal with some heat and fan noise. Now, there are smaller laptops available with powerful Intel and AMD components, but those have even more trade-offs to deal with. Either the components don't perform as well, or there is even more fan noise and heat you have to put up with. If you don't like these trade-offs, then you'll need to go with an Apple or Qualcomm processor. They use the ARM architecture. Their chips are much more power efficient, leading to less heat, less fan noise, and even better battery life. Apple's M series in particular delivers incredible performance for the least power draw. Apple's MacBooks are by far the quietest when doing performance tasks, and they are the only ones that have good battery life that you can actually do performance tasks while unplugged on. This sounds wonderful, but there is a catch. You see, not all applications run on Mac OS, particularly games. So if you are a gamer, you'll have to go with Intel or AMD. When it comes to Qualcomm, it's a little rougher. Laptops with their processors run the ARM version of Windows. Even though an application says it runs on Windows, it may not run on the ARM version of Windows. It's a little confusing. Right now, I'd only buy a Qualcomm laptop if you're just sticking to web browsing, office applications, collaboration software like Zoom, and remote work apps like Citrix. Those all work really well. And if that's all that you're doing on your laptop, a Qualcomm one is a really great option. All right, now that you know what kind of CPU to get, it's time to help you pick the specific one. Most manufacturers, they group their CPUs in three performance tiers. To make this choice as simple as possible, we've already grouped all the current processors into those three performance tiers on our website, bestlaptop.deals. If you expand the filters and scroll down to the processor section, you'll see basic, good, and max performance. Intel calls their least powerful processors Lunar Lake or Panther Lake. These processors have a U or a V at the end of their name, and as I said, they offer the best battery life. Intel's higher performing processors have an H at the end of their name, and their best performing ones have an HX. One of the biggest myths is that you get more performance if you move up from a Core Ultra 5 to a 7 or a 9. These used to be called i3, i5, i7, and i9. These designations, they do not matter nearly as much as they once did. The primary factor that now determines performance is which series the processor belongs to. A Core Ultra 7 is only faster than an Ultra 5 if it's from the same series. Said another way, in most cases, a Core Ultra 7 from Intel's most powerful HX series will perform much better than a Core Ultra 9 from their mid-level H series. AMD follows an even more confusing naming scheme. It's just a mess. Ryzen 5 is their basic performing processor that delivers solid battery life. Ryzen 7 is more powerful. Ryzen 9 is just confusing. Some of them are mid-tier processors and some are high-performing ones. We would say to look for an HX in the name, but the Ryzen 9 HX 370 chip, it's a bit of an outlier. It's not a max performing processor. It's more of an upper mid-range one. Funnily enough, Apple's M4 and M5 base processors are not actually basic performers. They're really on par with performance ones from other brands. Now, if you are considering getting a Max chip in a MacBook Pro 14, please keep the following in mind. It won't perform as well as it does in the larger MacBook Pro 16. The smaller 14, it doesn't have the beefier cooling solution to fully support it. And the same goes for the MacBook Air, where the M chips, they perform worse than they do in the Pros because they don't have a fan to keep them cool. Finally, we have Qualcomm. They have a base chip called the X. The next step up is the X Plus, and their most powerful processor is the X Elite. If you want to know how any specific laptop performs, I recommend looking at its Cinebench multi-core results. It's just a good proxy for overall CPU performance. To find these results, just click View Test Data on the laptop you may be interested in. It's a new feature over at bestlaptop.deals. And in future, we're going to allow you to sort laptops by our test results. All right, so now that you know what kind of CPU you want, let's talk about the GPU. That's, of course, if you even care about one. If you don't, obviously skip this section. 
<laughs> to make picking a GPU easy, we've once again broken them down into three performance tiers that you can see on our website bestlaptop.deals, they're under the filter section under the graphics card part. Generally speaking, basic GPUs they're good enough for light gaming, older titles say League of Legends. They're also good enough for some basic video editing, like stitching together a family video. If you want to play modern titles though, you'll want a GPU with good performance. If you want to play those titles at the higher settings, then max performance is what you need. For Windows laptops, Nvidia is pretty much the main player in town. Which actually makes picking one a bit easier. Their RTX 5050 is their entry level. Their RTX 5060 and 5070 they're great for gaming on a 1920x1200 resolution display as there are less pixels to render. They are powerful enough to drive a higher resolution 2560x1600 display so long as you turn down those settings pretty significantly or you turn on upscaling. But realistically, for gaming on a high resolution screen, you want a max performance GPU like the 5070 Ti, 5080 and 5090. When it comes to Apple, their Pro chips offer very good integrated graphics performance, and their Max chips offer Max performance. But before you choose a GPU, there are two major gotchas to be aware of, PowerDraw and VRAM. Oftentimes when a manufacturer places a GPU in a thin or a small laptop, they lower the power that they feed to it. This reduces the performance of the components inside so that the laptop doesn't get too hot. This means that two RTX 5060s can perform vastly differently depending on which laptop they are in. In fact, it gets worse. Sometimes a laptop is so small that its cooling solution it isn't good enough to allow it to even hit its manufacturer stated power draw. The tiny Asus Zephyrus G14, that's an example of this. It's a good example, but you could also call it a bad example. You see, according to Nvidia, a laptop with a 5070 Ti can drop to 140 watts. In the G14, Asus has capped that at 120, but in gaming, it rarely draws more than 90. This means it substantially underperforms other laptops with this GPU. Unfortunately, there is no easy way to find this out other than by watching one of our reviews or viewing our test data, which is now available on our website. We list each laptop's max power draw there and of course how it performs. But if this is just too much effort, in general, big thick heavy laptops they tend to feed their GPUs more power and therefore perform better. The next big gotcha when picking a GPU is VRAM. Many GPUs only have 8 gigs, which is not enough to run modern titles at ultra and sometimes not even high settings, especially when the laptop uses a high resolution screen like 2560x1600, which many laptops now do. If you're using a laptop with only 8 gig of VRAM, you may have to lower your settings. Otherwise, you could see stuttering in games, particularly during complex parts of the game like big battles. So be careful when comparing an RTX 5070 to a 5070 Ti. They may not look that different on paper, but the 5070 Ti it is much better. It's more powerful with more VRAM. It's 12 gig of VRAM, it pretty much solves this issue. The 5080 and the 5090 they have even more. Finally, as I touched on, it is important to pair a powerful enough CPU with your GPU so that it doesn't cause a bottleneck. The CPUs that we've classified as good performing, they match well with the GPUs that we've also classified as good performing. Same goes for max performance ones. Alright, let's talk memory. Most people should buy a laptop with 16 gig. 8 gig only if you're shopping on a very tight budget, less than $400. At this price you see most new Windows laptops, like Lenovo's IdeaPad 1, they're absolutely e-waste. Several of the ones that we bought, they didn't sit flat on our desk, they have terrible screens, dim with poor colour accuracy. Same goes for cheap laptops from other Windows manufacturers. I'd much prefer you buy an older MacBook Air with an M1 or M2 processor with 8 gig of memory than one of those cheap crappy ones with 16. You'll appreciate a better laptop far more than having more memory, at least most of you will. At the other end of the scale, 32 gig of memory is the right amount for people using professional applications. Software developers, most video editors, engineers, people like that. Now 64 gig, it's really excessive for most people, and it should only be purchased by those working on very large and extremely complex projects. Overspending on memory is one of the biggest issues I see laptop buyers make. One little note though, if the laptop has upgradable memory, two sticks of memory are faster than one. If it only has one stick of memory, it may be slowing you down. When it comes to storage, most laptops they have upgradable drives. If that's the one that you're looking at, well, you can just add more storage when you need it. 
If your laptop doesn't have that, like a MacBook, 256 gig is pretty small and should only be bought if you do not plan to keep a lot of photos or save videos on your computer itself. You're mainly using cloud storage. 512 gig is really what most people should be getting as a minimum. Now one terabyte, that's the safe amount if you're doing something more like gaming or video or photo editing. Two terabytes, that's the sweet spot if you're doing professional level video or photo editing, or you need to keep a massive game library on your computer itself. Say you're out working on an oil rig. All right, let's shift gears and talk about what display to get. This is for the most part a trade-off of portability versus productivity. The larger the display is, generally speaking, the more productive you'll be on your laptop, the more immersive it will be for gaming, and the more powerful the laptop will be because of that beefier cooling solution. But just having a large display, it doesn't actually mean that you'll see more content on its screen. The amount of content that you can comfortably see, it is a combination of the display's resolution, which is how sharp content looks, its brightness, and its size. A screen with a resolution at least 200 pixels per inch, but preferably higher, is going to make small text look nice and sharp. Below 180, small text is going to look a little fuzzy, and you'll likely want to zoom in to combat this, which means you'll see less information. Now, before you run out and buy the highest resolution screen possible, be careful. If you're a gamer, as I said, those extra pixels require more GPU power, and higher resolution screens, they hurt battery life. So here's my recommendation. If you're focusing on Excel work, programming, or anything with a lot of small text, get a display with a PPI well above 200. For example, 3200 by 2000 on a 16 inch panel. If you are gaming, a PPI above 160 but below 200 is a nice sweet spot. Say 2560 by 1600 resolution on a 16 inch panel. When it comes to brightness, 400 nits is good enough for most people. Anything below that and you may find your display just isn't bright enough in some environments. If your laptop has a glossy screen, you'll want to add 100 nits to this. You see glossy displays, they look very vibrant but they pick up reflections. You'll need a brighter display to combat them. If you're going for a matte or nano texture panel, these don't have reflections, but content doesn't look as vivid on them. Be aware, sometimes manufacturers list a laptop's HDR brightness, which is much higher than the brightness I've mentioned here. I'm talking about SDR. Also, you may see a couple of different display panel options available. IPS, it's the standard panel. When shopping for one, make sure its colors are good. You want to see sRGB close to 100%. If you're doing professional color work, P3 or Adobe RGB should be high as well. OLED panels have much better colors to begin with. They're also more vibrant as they show true blacks. Mini LED has the benefits of an OLED, but it is brighter, but it isn't as fast to refresh, so you may see some ghosting. Tandem OLEDs are the best currently available. All the benefits of OLED plus the brightness of mini LED. If you're a gamer, make sure you get a fast refresh rate panel so gameplay looks nice and smooth, 120 hertz or higher. Lastly, battery life. What determines a laptop's battery life is its battery size, what processor you're getting, and what display you get. Smaller displays with lower resolution, they last longer. All right. I want to end with the following. There are many different parts of a laptop that are important other than its specs. How well it is built, the quality of its webcam, how good its speakers sound, and as you've seen today, how its components perform can vary wildly. You really have to watch reviews before buying, but be careful. Many people who review laptops, they haven't actually used the laptop for that long, if at all. And of course, many YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram videos, they're just paid advertisements dressed up to appear like genuine reviews. And that's why we launched this channel. And that's why we built our website, bestlaptop.deals. Over there, you'll find the pros and cons of each laptop that we've actually tested and really used. You'll see our top tens for each type of laptop buyer, and you'll be able to track laptops prices right across retailers so you know you're getting the best deal. But most importantly, we can keep our recommendations there, up to date, well after our videos go live. If you haven't checked out bestlaptop.deals yet, what are you doing here? Head over there right now. I hope this guide helped arm you with enough information to pick your next laptop. If you are confused or you have questions, just post them down below or in our community. For more videos like this, get subscribed. Until next time, good luck with your laptop buying, and I'll catch you later.